Good morning. Good morning, Kyle. Good morning, everyone. It's an exciting day. Um, our first virtual day of action at the state capitol. Although many of us are at home or in our offices or maybe in our cars, no less, but be safe. Kyle, I'm Angela Munson, by the way. I have the wonderful pleasure of serving as director of the Oklahoma Policies Outreach and Legislative Team. And I shared this space this morning with my colleague and friend, Kyle Lawson. Good morning, Kyle. Good morning, Angela. And as Angela said, I'm Kyle Lawson. I am the senior organizer for the Oklahoma, Oklahoma Policy Institute. I primarily work through our grassroots coalition Together Oklahoma, which is why we're all here today. It's an exciting day uh, for those who are watching and listening who may not know much about this virtual space that they use, that we use. Uh, there'll be uh, messages just scrolling across the bottom of your screen. Uh, share it with your friends. We can be uh, viewed on YouTube, on Facebook, and I think Twitter, is that correct as well? Uh, so share it, we'll be with you for a little over an hour this morning. Uh, tell your friends, call your friends, call your neighbors, tell them that they need to hop on with us, learn a bit about what's going on at the state capitol, particularly those issues that affect our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and we're gonna have a little fun in the process. We've got some gift cards that I I've been told we can give out. So those of you who want to uh, join us and, oh, I got that crazy message that said your battery is low. Got to plug me in. Um, so those of you who want to join us uh, and participate and play with us, uh, do so. Uh, Kyle, how about you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you, advocates, for the contribution of your time this morning and joining us. <clears throat> If you are not currently a member of a chapter or want to uh, sign up for our action alerts, feel free to go over to, to togetherok.org, scroll to the bottom of the page to our quick links there, and you can sign up for our action alerts, you can sign up to join a chapter, and you can support our work. That's right. Uh, there it is, togetherok.org, right on the screen. Uh, sign up, learn what we're doing. Uh, we need people. That's what today is about, uh, to make sure people understand that they are important and are valuable and they're important to this whole process. Uh, we look around, we see so many challenges before us. Kyle, I don't know about you, but this has been a hard day, a hard year, not a hard day, but a hard year, hard, hard last uh, nine or 10 months for most people in the U.S. And the challenges that were there before are still with us. And sometimes they're even worse and they're harder. Uh, but I've always been taught that no challenge uh, is so large or so difficult that we can't overcome it. It may take longer than we expect. It may be a bit harder than we expect. And it may require more resources. But people who collectively come together and organize can make a difference. I always say the rule, it only takes two or three people to start a revolution. Uh, but it takes a whole lot more to continue it. So uh, it's a great morning. Uh, we're excited about this opportunity. And uh, we just want you again to tell your friends uh, to sign in, join with us. We've got some gift cards that we're going to give out. You got to comment to do that. You got to be in the process, be in the mix of things uh, to be eligible for those gift cards. And we'll announce uh, when we're going to do those drawings. We still have Jessica, our virtual gift drawer. She's kind of like the Vanna White of sorts of StreamYard. And uh, she knows the drill. Some of you who've been with us, you've done this before. You got to comment to be able to play. Absolutely. Thank you, Angela. Um, and thank you again to everybody joining us. As Angela said, feel free to share this out uh, to your friends, share this out to your, to your networks on social media, encourage them to join us and sign in with us. And I also want to say a special thank you to our comms team who are working diligently on the back end of this event to make it so successful and helped us to build up today. So thank you, comms, for your help there.
Yes, comms team, I think in the whole wide world. And for we always use the word comms team, it's actually communications team. And they do a fantastic job of creating the kind of platforms and the environment that we need to be able to communicate with you, particularly again in this space of the virtual world that we live in now. Uh, it's so important to have people who know what they're doing and do it well. Uh, and Jessica and Dave and uh, Josie and I know Miguel and I know I'm missing someone. I shouldn't start calling names. Uh, the whole big entire Oklahoma policy family uh, actually has made this event happen today. Kyla and I have the good pleasure of being with you and seeing you and, and enjoying some time together and uh, being uh, the host of sorts for today, the MCs for today. Uh, but it's really important that uh, we recognize all those other folk who really made today happen. So thank you. Kyle, I think we have some introductions. If we were at the Capitol in, in a rally environment, just imagine, and I wish I could, you know, really um, send out those vibes of being on the south side of the Capitol steps, right, Kyle, uh, with a crowd cheering. And uh, so, you know, in that comment section, you know, do some raised hands or some applause or whatever you would normally do if you were in the Capitol with us and let those folk who are going to speak to us and be with us this morning uh, realize they're being heard and what they say is of great value. Um, so if we were at the Capitol, in the people's house, uh, there are individuals, a whole 149 of them, called state representatives and state senators, who uh, go to work there pretty much every day during session and some pretty much every day all year long. Uh, but we always believe when we're in the Capitol, on the Capitol grounds, although we're in our homes or wherever today, it's important to hear uh, from the people who represent us. So we've asked our uh, legislative leaders to extend a greeting uh, to all of us, to all of you, uh, for being with us today. So we're going to listen to our first greeting because in the virtual world and legislative session, it's important to sometimes pre-record some things. So we have some live presenters and some recorded presenters, uh, but we're just so happy that the minority leader of the House, Representative Emily Virgin, uh, was able to record a greeting and recognize and honor you, those individuals who are with us this morning. So, Jessica, we're on to hear from Representative Emily Virgin. Well, Kyle, as things go in this virtual world, unexpected events happen. I don't know about you, I'm old, so it may have been my ears, but I don't think we could hear Representative Virgin's greeting. So I'm not sure what was going on there. I hope we didn't jinx the comms teams, but they are really, really that good. So we can replay that. Uh, we also have a greeting from uh, Senator Kay Floyd, who is the minority leader in the Senate. So we're going to bring Senator Floyd up uh, and uh, listen to her greetings. And then we're going to come back to uh, Representative Virgin. That's a good thing about, you know, 
recorded videos. We can play them over and over. And by the way, this event uh, is being uh, taped. It's being recorded. It can be aired and viewed a million times, if you like, over our Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter channels. Absolutely. So, uh, what do you think? Shall we try Senator Floyd now? Kyle? Before, we, before we get into that, I did want to say that um, already we've had one advocate, Brittany from Edmond, has already gone to the website at togetheroklahoma.org or togetherok.org um, and scroll to the bottom and has signed up for our uh, action alerts. Um, so again, if you want to, feel free to go over to togetherok.org and sign up to be a member of a chapter or for action alerts and or support our work. Great. Senator Floyd. leader up here at the Oklahoma Capitol. Welcome to Advocacy Day up at the Capitol. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I wanted to send you a virtual message and tell you how much we appreciate all that you do as advocates. It is so very important as a legislator for me to hear from you and to hear what's important to you all. And I know my colleagues feel the same way. So enjoy your, your meeting. And please, if you ever have any needs or questions, feel free to call me. My Capitol number is 521 5610, and I'll be happy to help. Thank you. You know, Kyle, I'm an old has been senator. Uh, so I have, I'm an old has been house member too, for that matter. Uh, so it's always good to hear from legislators. They do hard work. Their work is hard. And again, that's why it's so important, right? Absolutely. For them to hear for, from the people they represent. Absolutely. I think many of our um, policy experts and many of our advocates and uh, team at Together OK has said numerous times that sometimes it just takes five or 10 folks calling their legislator and expressing their opinion from their district to create change on certain policy. And I do think, Angela, that we're going to go back and revisit uh, with Representative and uh, Minority Leader Emily Virgin. Thank you. Sometimes <laughs> what that, that happens. I know that we do have that video clip available and perhaps at some time that today we can get that into um, our event. Um, yeah, I, but I know that it will be available on our social medias later on. I well. certainly hope so. I, I certainly hope so um, because it's important to hear what members say to us. Uh, we did invite other leaders of the legislature to join us this morning. Unfortunately, their schedules didn't permit, uh, but we're going to do more of these. So we're just telling people that they have an opportunity to um, hear from their legislators virtually. We're going to create that space uh, any number of times between now and the end of the session. Uh, and you know, Kyle, what you think? Even when we are able to meet in person, is this a good venue that you, that we could use to engage others? I think so. Absolutely. I think that um, the only good thing for me that came from the pandemic was this virtual space that's been created for advocates to gather together and do the work that we do and be able to connect from throughout the state. I know there are folks joining us right now virtually for the first time at their capital that they've been able to because sometimes distance does play a factor into um, unavailability to get to the capital during session. So this virtual space has created a wonderful space for advocates to do this work. That's absolutely right. Uh, and I know the schedule of legislators are, are busy. We were stalling. Now we've got the note that our Next guest who's here live with us is here in studio. So we're excited about that. We know they're in busy, busy, busy in session. So uh, Kyle, do you wanna give a quick introduction to Representative Bell? Yeah, absolutely. Up next, we have uh, Representative Bell from Norman, who is a dear friend of mine um, and actually started out um, doing this work as a Together Oklahoma advocate. So let's kick it over to Representative Bell and see what she has to say for us. Oh, I'm having a little trouble. 
sometimes at the Capitol, the, the connection's a little... A little bad. We'll just stay little here little. until she... I've had the good fortune of uh, meeting and working with Representative Bell, uh, and she's a, a fairly new member, and Kyle said it. She got her start through Together Oklahoma. Uh, you know, so we don't, it's not our intent to create legislators. We want to create, as she is, create advocates. And it's double duty and good for us when we can not only get a great advocate, but a great representative too, just like Representative Bell. We see you, Representative Bell. Can you hear us? I think she is working on accessing the link from her phone so that she can join us with audio. But she looks great too. She does. Uh, Representative Bell is a very, very active, busy member. Uh, and we just appreciate, again, her taking the time, trying to figure out um, all of this new technology and in the Capitol building uh, where it is hard sometimes. It's a big building. The building is beautiful for those guests who are beautiful. And she was almost with us, those guests. Can you see us and hear us, Representative Bell? I can. Can you see me? Absolutely. We good morning. We can. Hey, good morning, oh. everybody. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Our Wi-Fi here in the house is um, interesting. <laughs> this session. <laughs> So, so, so thanks for bearing gonna, with me. I'm going to say this, no problem. Then we're going to turn it over to you. Uh, okay. But that interesting Wi-Fi in the house. Uh, so you can you can really feel for all of those people in across Oklahoma, particularly rural Oklahoma, but other places that have difficulty accessing the internet. Uh, oh, absolutely. So we we have work to do on that end. Kyle gave you a great introduction, and we're just happy that you're with us. We're going to give the floor to you now. Thank you. Thank you both. It's good to see you. And um, wish I could see everybody else, but I can see your comments in the chat. So if you have uh, comments or questions for me, be sure to put them there. So if I'm not mistaken, I'm here to talk about advocacy today, right? Which is one of my favorite topics, of course. Um, and I, I don't know if Kyle mentioned this in his intro, but Together Oklahoma is obviously very near and dear to my heart because being a member of Together Oklahoma is really where I uh, got my first start as an advocate myself. And the group that really inspired me to carry that advocacy forward by running for office. So I'm always happy to be with members of Together Oklahoma, always happy to talk about how best to advocate for the issues that are most important to you. So um, I would I was thinking about this this morning that, you know, my experience before joining Together Oklahoma was very despondent <laughs> because I knew that there were things going on in my community and I'm from Norman. So I knew that there were things going on in Norman that weren't necessarily being talked about. And I didn't really know where to turn in terms of finding solutions for how to fix them. Now, sometimes those are city issues. You know, if we're talking about, um, things that affect our homes and our daily lives, um, you know, our water resources, our trash pickup, things that are happening even in our schools sometimes, you know, that might be a school board issue or a city issue. But I think that there are larger things going on at the state level. And one of the reasons I really wanted to get involved at the state level is because I could see that it wasn't just affecting our community, things like public education, but they were affecting all communities across our state. And we may have very different opinions on how to deal with those things in the state capitol. Um, that's certainly been reflected this year so far. Um, but we all have the same overarching concerns, whether that's about ed or healthcare or, um, you know, access to resources or how we value our natural resources and who we think should have access to them and uh, the ways in which we think that they should be protecting them, if that's something that's important to us. So the state level is really interesting, um, especially as compared to local politics, because <laughs> and I've talked with my, uh, my uh, fellow public servants on the Norman City Council about this, that I can go to the grocery store, for instance, without being accosted 
in the grocery store, right? Hey, you, what's going on with my trash pickup? I didn't get my trash picked up and I want to know what you're going to do about it, right? I've heard about those conversations happening in public spaces and I've seen them and witnessed them myself. The difference when it comes to the state level is that, and I don't know if this is just because of a misconception, but often the issues that we talk about at the state level don't always register for people as things that actually do impact their daily lives. But boy, do they. And so I think that there's sometimes this disconnect where people think, well, they're at the state level and they're not really thinking about it in the same way. Or there may just be sort of a cultural disconnect where, yeah, but they're a state representative or they're a state senator and I shouldn't be addressing them or approaching them in that way. You know, there's this sort of like personal disconnect as if we don't want to be reached out to by citizens and neighbors. And that's not true. <laughs> Actually, it's far from the truth. And being in Together Oklahoma as a member, I really came to learn and discover that whatever mystique there is around state representation or state the state legislature as a whole, we've got to get over that as citizens. Uh, the secret is that our voices as citizens really do matter to the people who are representing us. In fact, they have a lot more weight than we think that they do. You know, the cynical side of me as an advocate first often thought, well, I'm not a lobbyist. I'm not here representing some big corporation or entity. I'm just one person. So they're not going to listen to me. You know, even if I shout very loudly, my representative or my senator are not going to listen to me. And that's just not the case, which is good because one voice alone, you know, unless you're really persistent, <laughs> may not have the same effect as you would think it would for a lobbyist or some other big entity with lots of voices. But two together Oklahoma members, four together Oklahoma members from one district. Now you're talking about real power to affect a conversation. And the reason why is because, you know, lobbyists come and go, special interests come and go. They have particular bills that they might want to get heard that would be better for their business, better for their employees, better for their bottom line. But once that issue is over, the conversation is over. When it comes to conversations with constituents, those conversations are ongoing. And no member wants to go home to their district and have somebody say, especially in a public forum, well, I came to you about my issue. In fact, all four of us came to you about this issue that we're very passionate about. And you didn't give us the time of day. And we remember that you didn't listen to us. And we're still here. We're still your neighbors. We're still your constituents. And we still care about this issue. And we want you to find a solution for it. And we're not going to go away until you do. That is a very, very powerful position to be in. So, you know, the, the point of advocacy and the reason why we should do it, I think, is clear. Because our voices really do matter. And the more people that we can sort of band together with and go in with uh, really good conversation points to a member's office, the better. But the question remains, how best do we reach out to our legislators? And over time, I've discovered that there are some ways that are better than others. You know, we get outreach from constituents from um, in, in many different methods. So that might be on social media. That could be an email or a call to the office. It could be an in-person visit. It could be a virtual meeting request and in these, uh, in these almost post-pandemic times, but not quite post-pandemic times. So what's the best way? Well, I think it really depends on the member. There's no wrong way, really, to contact a legislator, but there are ways that each member prefers. So for instance, I can get a little bit bogged down in social media especially in direct messages from people. I don't check them all the time. 
Um, and then I feel really bad that I wasn't checking them because I want to be able to answer as quickly as I can. So I always encourage people to reach out directly to the office because then not only I see it, but my wonderful, super talented assistant, Lene Dowdell, sees them too. So, you know, you kind of get two sets of eyes on every contact that you make directly with the office. And you have two people to contact if you don't hear back from us, which is also nice. Is an email better? Is a phone call better? Again, it depends on the member. It depends on how formal they want that relationship with you to be. But really, the window into those communications is a legislative assistant. Really, you know, I probably shouldn't say this, but Lene basically runs my life. And thank goodness for her. <laughs> because if there are things that I miss because I'm on the floor or I'm just scatterbrained that day because I'm thinking about a thousand different things, it really help me focus in on what I need to focus on. And legislative assistants in the House and the Senate are often here and know the lay of the land because they have done it for so long. This week, we are celebrating 35 years for one of our legislative assistants. That's way longer than any member will ever be here. So they really are the windows into their members' offices and kind of gatekeepers to those members. If you can make a good relationship with a legislative or executive, um, executive assistant on the Senate side, then all the better. Um, because they really do kind of hold those keys to conversations with members. But also having your ducks in a row, for lack of a better word, having key information and being able to deliver it really concisely to a member so that, you know, obviously you want to be nice and you want to have a good conversation with them and not just jump right into an issue. But honestly, if I know that somebody is from Together Oklahoma, I know that we're on the same page and I'm ready to listen to what you have to say. So, you know, we can skip all the conversation about the weather and just jump right into the issue. <laughs> I'm always happy to do that and talk about the weather afterwards. But, you know, figuring out ways to communicate with the member that you're about to approach, figuring out what kind of makes that member tick, you know, doing some background and intel on the person that you're about to approach and the things that seem important to them on, you know, just a, a surface search, whether it's on Google or reading their biography on their house website, any insight that you can have into that person before you approach them is going to be really helpful. So then once you do get to the issue and you have that really clear and concise information, to present to the member, you're off to the races. And I guarantee you, even if they don't seem open and receptive to what you're saying at first, try, try again. There's nothing wrong with sending a follow-up, uh, you know, to thank the member for listening. You know, massaging egos can also go a long way. Um, thanking them for their time, uh, being very kind and cordial, even if it feels like, especially when you're really passionate about an issue, like the last thing you want to do to somebody who you don't feel really listened to you the first time. But the first time is often just an introduction to you and to the issue. The second time, third time, the fourth time, I promise you that they're listening. And again, if they know that you are a constituent, if they know that you're not going to go away <laughs> and go quietly into that night about the issue that you're passionate about, Eventually, I think you'll make those inroads. Just takes patience and perseverance, really. Those, are, I think, are the keys. So, you know, it's, it's about trying to kind of recap here. It's about coalition building with other people. It's about persistence. It's about really knowing your stuff when you come into the meeting and, you know, trying to have um, those those open and receptive and respectful conversations with members in whatever way they see fit and being prepared to have them wherever, you know, meeting them wherever they are. If that's on Twitter or uh, Facebook, if that's an email, if that's in a personal conversation, uh, you know, we have members who like to meet in district on Fridays with people at a local coffee shop and they always choose the same coffee shop to go to. So, you know, it's really just about being flexible and meeting people where they are too. 
So what do you think? Should we open up for questions or comments or concerns, you guys? Generally, this platform that we're using is, uh, although people can scroll, it may not be so conducive to questions and answers, but what we will ask our listening audience to do, if you do have questions that you'd like or comments that you'd like for us to share with Representative Bell, please still put them uh, in and we'll make sure that Representative Bell hears your comments. Uh, everything that I see is, yay, she did a fantastic job. Great. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Thanks, everybody. It's been great. And, and we'll make, but we know you have session too. So we want to be respectful of your time. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah, it's been a long week of sessions. So I'm hoping they give us a little bit of a break today, but no rest for the wicked. We're, we're here until all those bills get heard. So, Hell. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Representative Bell, for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. That was exciting. Well, you know, we said some Representative Bell is great by the way, let me say that. So thank you. And those of you who don't know her, you should get to know her. Those of you in your district, uh, get to know her. She believes in everything that she said. And not only does she say it, she puts action to it. We mentioned earlier that if you chatted and, and responded, we put your name in a drawing and that Jessica, AKA Vanna, would pull your name. We have our first winner, Kyle. All right. And I'd like to announce the winner of our first gift card. It is Miss Arlie Hampton. So Arlie Hampton, you are the winner of our first, I don't know, it's either $25 or $30 or I don't know, somewhere in that box. Won't make you rich, but every <laughs> little bit helps. Uh, and uh, Arlie, I, I know I think we can, um, if you'll, Send, I think, I don't know, Jessica, you know how to make this work so we can get the information uh, and, and make sure that info at Together Oklahoma, uh, we can get that card to you. So we've got some exciting things coming up next. Um, our program is going to focus on three very, very important issues, not just to Oklahoma policy and our Together Oklahoma members, but really to all Oklahomans. And the first issue we want to talk about is within our category, our focus category of thriving families, the importance that families in Oklahoma have some economic security and that they feel that they can live and not live um, always struggling from payday to payday uh, are just one, as we say, one payday away from just totally going bankrupt. So we have some three individuals who are going to share with us their thoughts about thriving families, about the earned income tax credit, uh, the refundability of that tax credit. I'd like to call it a tax cut. You know, we want to give tax cuts to a lot of other people who have a lot more resources and we want to be really focused on providing those kinds of tax cuts to individuals who work hard every day and who struggle, and that's a whole lot of Oklahomans out there. So our first speaker that I'd like to bring up is Mr. Paul Sheehan. Paul is a senior policy analyst uh, with OK Policy, focusing on the area of budget. Uh, and I think Paul is with us somewhere. Paul, there you are. He's signing in. There he is. Paul, thank you so much for sharing uh, information again with our listeners, and I'll pass it on to you now. All righty. Thank you, Angela. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn my camera off. I'm on uh, about the third tier of technology here. And so I'm going to uh, get louder when I turn my camera off and speak right into my old phone. Thank you, everyone, for being here and for the work that you do uh, to make Oklahoma better. And that's what our Thriving Families agenda is about, is making Oklahoma better. Our state's only as strong as we are each individually strong and too many Oklahomans are being left behind, especially families, especially with children, especially low income families, especially non-white families, especially families led by women. All of these groups Well, looks like we lost Paul. Uh, I guess technology is just not on our side this morning, but that's okay. We are going to make it through. Uh, thank you, uh, Paul. Keep working that technology. Paul's going to give us some facts, but it's okay. 
to take some things out of order because all of our three speakers have important information to share. So as Jessica loads up a recorded message, again, another recorded message, it helps, uh, from State Senator Georgia Young, who represents Senate District 48. Uh, I know that district well, my old Senate seat. And uh, George has introduced legislation since his time in the House of Representatives and now as a senator to really improve the quality of life, the economic status of Oklahoma's low income, hard working families, people who go to work every day, but still can't make a wage that moves them out of poverty. So uh, without further ado, let us hear uh, the message from State Senator George Young. Greetings. My name is George Young. I'm the state senator with Senate District 48. And uh, I'm very excited about this moment to be able to talk about just taxation, which is a very serious and important matter to all people, but particularly those, uh, and, I, and I will say in particular those in my district, in Senate District 48, which is, encompasses Northeast Oklahoma City and parts of Northwest Oklahoma City. Uh, history has created some problems as far as taxation is concerned. And those who make the tax laws have created some problems for those of us who have been impacted by history. And so it is important for all of us to pay close attention uh, to the process that goes into creating tax laws and the present tax laws. And there are several, I want to talk about a couple in particular that I want to highlight today. But it's very important to all of us because those of us who are in the working classes, who go out every day, those who are hourly workers, those who are, uh, are working and, 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 and trying their best to make a living, that we won't people to be able to work because a broader tax base gives us more income into the state coffers to be able to do the services that the state is responsible for doing. The state is responsible for caring for those who cannot care for themselves. The state is responsible for law enforcement. The state is in, uh, responsible for uh, emergency services. And so it is important that we have a broad tax base. We want everybody contributing to that tax base. But sometimes the tax laws impact us in such a way that it takes away from that group. It takes away from that broad base. And just a couple of things. Uh, I guess a lot of the people are talking about now is the earned income tax credit. Now you gotta remember, and there will be others I know who will talk about this, but you're talking about two different things, the federal earned income tax credit and the state earned income tax credit. Uh, the interesting thing is that uh, earned income tax credit came into existence under President Reagan and in Oklahoma under Governor Keating, both Republican governors, who saw, and if you go back and research it, uh, uh, President Reagan said that he did it because he knew there was a need to help people who were struggling just trying to make it. And so for people who had a certain income, who had children, he, he placed into tax law this ability for folk to be helped. Uh, and if you really want to look at it from a social standpoint, Dr. Martin Luther King in his last book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos to Community, placed as one of the things he wanted to see was a check sent out to, and now we're getting with the COVID checks, but he, we were talking about every month that a check be sent out to people who were struggling, who were unable to make it on their own, not because they didn't have the ability to, not that they uh, did not access the opportunities, but because of the history of this nation, because of the way things have happened, they have been prevented from fully vesting into this American dream, as people like to say. And so third income tax credit really comes out of a legitimate point of view. It's very helpful to all people, to all of those who are economically challenged. I will say this, uh, four or five years ago, when the Senate of uh, when the Oklahoma House of Representatives, and I was a state representative then, and voted against it, decided to take away the earned income tax credit from those who lived in the state of Oklahoma on the state level. They did it because we were facing a billion dollar budget. What good did that do? It was only about 60, 70 million dollars that they got from this, but they hurt the most vulnerable in our community. And it was hurtful to me because I was the state representative for House District 99. And that district was the district that was most severely impacted. A half a million dollars was sucked out of House District 99 by the signing of that bill, which did nothing to offset that billion 
dollar deficit that we were facing. And so historically, there have been some things that have impacted us. It is important that we pay attention to the tax laws. It is important that we look at these things that impact us every day, particularly, again, for those who are out there working every day, trying to make it. Why do we put additional burdens upon them? Why do we put additional taxation upon them? When you look at our tax structure, there's got to be a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, you know, the higher you go up and the more money you make, it seems as if the less percentage wide taxes you pay. And that is true. Now, the dollar amount is obviously larger. But when you look at the basis, we still try to form and to support our government, all of our services that governments uh, give out on the backs of those who are least able to do it. And so I, I'm glad to be able to say for a moment, I'm glad that this is an issue. I hope we will talk about it more and more. I think it's ultimately important that we start talking about how taxation affects each and every one of us and just not talk about how bad the IRS is and OTC, the Oklahoma Tax Commission, but start looking at the laws and paying attention to it and take advantage take advantage of those things such as the earned income tax credit on your federal tax return and to speak up about the earned income tax credit being taken away from those who live in the state of Oklahoma on the state level. I've had a bill for the last four years ever since they rescinded it. I've had a bill before in the House and now I've had one the last two years in the Senate, last three years in the Senate, and they have not heard those bills. And again, it would not impact our overall budget uh, to the extent that it would cause any problems at all. But it it is important and significant for those who are trying to make it, particularly in the in the in line of COVID and what COVID has COVID has done for us and what done to us as a as a state. And so it would be very important, be very beneficial. I, I go the earned income tax credit plus minimum wage bill that I've run for the four or five years, they go hand in hand because they look at the taxations that falls upon us that causes us problems that really that causes the state problem because when we can broaden that tax base i want to end where i started when we can broaden that tax base we can get more folk in the working population we get more folk who are paying taxes fairly and justly and people who see the results of their taxes being paid that's when we'll get to the point where we'll have a state that is hitting as we like to say on all cylinders. Thank you so much. Continue this struggle, continue this conversation. I think it's ultimately important to each and every one of us. Thank you and God bless you. Wow, wow. I'll, I just simply want to say amen uh, to that. And Rep uh, Senator Young said, uh, let's continue the discussion. Well, let's do that right now. There is another individual um, who has, has worked with folk, who works with folk regularly uh, that benefit from or who need to benefit from the refundability of the earned income tax credit, the earned income tax credit, federal level at the state level. Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce my friend, uh, my colleague. Uh, I also like to think a little bit, maybe a little minty, uh, Bailey Perkins. Bailey is the uh, state advocacy and public policy director for the Regional Food Bank. And Regional Food Bank, I Bailey, goes beyond Oklahoma borders, I think, and provides some services elsewhere. And if it doesn't, you can correct me, but I know your reach goes way beyond the Oklahoma borders. And uh, the Food Bank, of course, has expressed some interest in uh, restoring the refundability and expanding the in earned income tax credit. So talk to us a minute as an advocate for these tax fairer, as Senator Young says, a fair and a more just taxation system. Uh, Bailey Perkins. Thank you so, so much. It's an honor to be back in this space to participate in Together Oklahoma's uh, Virtual Day of Action. My name is Bailey Perkins, um, and I am the State Advocacy and Public Policy Director for both Regional Food Bank of Oklahoma and Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma. So Regional Food Bank serves 53 counties in Central and Western Oklahoma, and Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma serves 24 counties in the eastern part of the state, but collectively we're able to help distribute food to all 77 counties um, through the state of Oklahoma, thanks to our incredible partner network of pantries um, and, and um, other community partners. 
so I come to this space to talk about the earned income tax credit and its impact on Oklahomans who are facing food insecurity. So when we're talking about hunger, it rarely involves food itself. We have plenty of food in this country, right? It's more about access and affordability. When we're talking about ways to combat hunger in the state, we have to think of solutions that tackle the root causes. Uh, one of those root causes is poverty. People just don't have enough money to make ends meet, nor the ability to buy nutritious foods. That could be there's not a grocery store um, in distance near enough for them to purchase nutrition, nutritious foods, or they may not just have enough money to do so. So when we hear lawmakers and we think about the term tax cuts, we must think of the EITC and urge our lawmakers to boost that credit. Increasing the value of this tax credit and restoring refundability is essential for a few reasons I'd like to lift in my five minutes. So first, it's the most responsible way to provide tax relief to those who work hard daily and need the support. It's one of the easiest ways to put resources into the hands of Oklahomans, and it only takes a small amount of resources when you think about the full picture of our budget uh, to restore refundability at the state level. Secondly, I'd say the earned income tax credit is important because refundability of it provides critical support for millions of working Americans, children, and families every single year. The EITC provides and it supplements low wages, and it can help soften the financial impact of fluctuating incomes and job losses, like during this time with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's one of the strongest anti-poverty tools that we have because it provides direct support to low and moderate income earners. And lastly, EITC is important because it's an economic stimulus, because people tend to spend those dollars back into their local economies. They use those dollars to catch up on bills. Um, they'll use it to put children in summer camps, buy summer and fall clothes for their kids, or even stock up food in the refrigerators. Uh, research tells us that the EITC rewards work, supports families, and boosts the economy. So. Here's where you come in as an advocate, right? You have to talk with lawmakers and you have to tell your story. Tell them what an extra boost in tax season would do for you and your family. We must demand that the legislature put money back into the pockets of Oklahomans working to make ends meet by making the earned income tax credit refundable again. Um, a few sessions ago, the legislature made the income tax credit non-refundable so at the state level because they had to balance out the state budget during a time of a budget crisis. But there's bipartisan agreement that the legislature should fix this tough decision that they made back then, and they haven't done so at this point. So making the earned income tax credit refundable again can make the difference for so many Oklahomans. And that can only happen if you are leveraging your voice and advocating. Uh, this year, the revenue projections are better than expected. So there's no better time for our lawmakers to make it right on the EITC and help Oklahomans during this economic downturn caused by COVID. So take time today and over the next couple of months, because we're about to enter the budget season, to call the House and Senate Appropriations and Budget Chairman, and that's Chairman Wallace on the House side and Chairman Thompson on the Senate side, as well as your state House and Senate members, and urge them to make the EITC refundable again. Thank you for your time. Um, if you ever have questions or need anything, uh, you can reach me at bperkins at rfbo.org. Um, or of course, you can follow Community Food Bank of Eastern Oklahoma, Regional Food Bank of Oklahoma um, on all social media platforms and our website as well if there's any information needed or Oklahomans who need help at this time. So thank you so much for having me together, Oklahoma.
Hey, Bailey, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your contact information as well. Uh, you know, we have a big reach, lots of issues that we have to address. Um, and we are depending on those of you who are out there listening to participate with us at Together Oklahoma. Join us as we make Oklahoma a better state. Make sure you put your comments in uh, the chat box and that those features so you can be eligible for our next drawing. But I wanna move us quickly to our next segment. Uh, and we want to talk about criminal justice issues. We've talked about earned income tax credit and economic issues, a little about minimum wage, but just as important to many, many Oklahoma families is this issue of people going to prison, losing jobs, not being able to take care of their families, all those kinds of things that come as a result of interaction in a negative way with Oklahoma's criminal justice system. And there are individuals who are working on that very, very hard. I'd like to introduce the first, who's probably spent his uh, a big chunk of his very young life, uh, Former Speaker of the House, Chris Steele, who is now the director, executive director, CEO of Teen Ministries here in Oklahoma City. Chris, thank you for being with us this morning. Unmute yourself or somebody will unmute you. Uh, and I'm going to give the floor to you now in the interest of time to introduce us to this whole notion of criminal justice reform. And good morning and thank you again. Good morning to you. I am so delighted, honored, um, just over the moon to get to be here with, with you all today. I want to start by saying thank you. Thank you to Senator Monson for the invitation and for everyone who is participating in the Oklahoma Policy Institute's Advocacy Day today. Your uh, efforts, your engagement, your involvement uh, makes all the difference. Literally, it makes all the difference. And so thank you so much for that. I will just give a quick uh, note to say that I joined just a few minutes earlier backstage. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm late because when Senator Monson was uh, introducing Bailey and said that I'm about to introduce one of my mentees, I thought she was talking about me because I consider uh, Angela Monson to be my mentor as, as well. So thank you all for that. I'm going to jump right in and just tell you that criminal justice reform in my estimation, is it's paramount in the state of Oklahoma. We have um, one of the highest incarceration rates per capita of any state in the nation, and we have had uh, goodness for, for decades. And there's just no reason that we should be a nation leader uh, in female incarceration. There is no reason that we should be a national leader in uh, racial disparities within our criminal justice system. There's no reason that we should continue to criminalize people who are stuck in poverty or people who have experienced trauma or for any of those reasons. We are better than that uh, as Oklahomans. Uh, I just wanna state some of the obvious things here. The people who live in our state are not worse than the people who live in any other state. In fact, as a lifelong Oklahoman, I would contend that some of the greatest people on the planet live here in our state. And, and the difference is we have some of the worst sentencing guidelines and some of the worst policies that continue to emphasize punishment and retribution over rehabilitation, restoration, uh, and, and reclamation. So uh, ultimately, let me just point out that, uh, as you all know, because I know that you're a very informed audience, um, Oklahoma has a balanced budget amendment in our state constitution. And what that means in essence is that the legislature cannot appropriate more money than it takes in in any given fiscal year. Uh, and what that means is the more money we continue to spend on mass incarceration, the less money we have to spend on education. The more money that we spend on incarceration, the less money we have to spend on health care or services for kiddos in at-risk situations or infrastructure or anything else that we may deem to be a core service of state government. So we have to get to the point that we can see this from a, a value add in reference to our state budget. Are we investing our dollars in a way that's going to actually improve the quality of life within Oklahoma? Are we investing our resources in a way that's actually going to help people reach their full potential? Or are we going to continue to exclude and demonize and give up on people simply because they've made a mistake? A couple of things that I've learned that I think are important as we communicate with our legislature is that there are driving issues behind um, uh, the mass incarceration epidemic in Oklahoma that in my estimation are not being addressed adequately. Uh, we know that the driving factors behind our incarceration rates are often uh, related to issues of unresolved trauma. 
Uh, they're related to issues of untreated mental illness. Uh, they're related to issues of addiction, poverty, limited educational opportunities, and the such. We have to get to the point where we understand that if we can invest properly and adequately in these kinds of services, we will see a reduction in our crime rates. We will see an improvement in our quality of life for everyone. Research is on our side. Uh, there's no question that, that we now know that ex excessive prison sentences for, for individuals um, does not equate to greater public safety. In fact, excessive sentences tends to make the situation worse. It adds to the instability. It costs a fortune. It tears families apart. It ruins lives. And, and we do not need to continue down this path of perpetuating uh, funding a broken system that is producing uh, the opposite results that we would want to do. So I would just offer a uh, very quick uh, a couple of thoughts. When we look at our own statistics and, and we compare what we're doing and, and where we're at to, to the rest of the nation, there's a couple of things that jump off the page. Number one, uh, the amount of time that, that individuals convicted of nonviolent offenses spend in the Oklahoma penal system. Currently, people who are convicted of nonviolent, low-level property crimes spend 70% longer in Oklahoma prison than the national average. People convicted of drug-related crimes tend to spend 79% longer in Oklahoma prison than they would anywhere else in the nation. We have to understand that addiction is a health issue. It is a disease, and it ought to be treated as such. Mental illness is not a crime. People who experience trauma need help. They need support. They need assist assistance. They don't need prison time. We need to um, be about the business of incorporating a system that apps, uh, actually sets people up to succeed, not that sets people up for failure. So just a couple of things to point out. It's been a tough, tough year. Um, I think that if I'm just going to be candid, I think that at a moment in time where our nation is beginning to take some steps toward um, and in the right direction of racial rec reckoning, Oklahoma appears to be taking a step backwards. So we did not, um, a lot of our most impactful bills this session did not make it past a committee deadline, which was actually yesterday for the Senate. It was extended, but it was over yesterday. And so there's some things that did not make it out. But there's some other things that are very much alive. House Bill 1679 by Representative Stark would actually uh, begin the process of ensuring that when a person has paid their debt and completed their sentence, that before they reenter the community, they would have basic essentials like a state ID and uh, a driver's license and um, uh, a, a resume and some, some opportunities to move forward in life. I think it's a very important bill. Uh, another bill that's worth noting be the um the uh, let me get this right it would be uh senate bill where is it at senate bill uh 951 that basically says that people will no longer be imprisoned for failure to pay and that before a person is revoked uh for being behind on fees and fines there would be a means test this is actually by senator julie daniels and i think it has tremendous merit and it ought to be something that we should consider um I would also say that we have to be careful to not only play offense and consider what we need to be expanding on and what we can do to continue to take steps forward. We to also have to be willing to play defense in the legislature and protect the reforms that have already been enacted. So in 2016, the people of Oklahoma, I'm talking about the people of Oklahoma, uh, voted in favor of state question 780. And the premise of that legislation was to reclassify lower level property crimes and simple uh, possession related offenses as misdemeanors rather than felonies. Ever since that day, there have been multiple legislative attacks to undo that policy and to revert back to tagging everyone who commits a crime as a convicted felon. We have to guard against those rollbacks and there is a bill, Senate Bill 334, that seeks to uh, diminish um, the impact and, and repeal part of the impact of state question 780. Senate Bill 334 is bad policy. It's against the will of the people. 
and it needs to go away. And so any efforts that you can give in, in encouraging your legislator to vote against 334 would be very, very helpful. We cannot afford to take a step backwards, particularly when we have so much work to do. Here's what I know. We cannot afford to give up on one another as fellow Oklahomans. There is no such thing as a spare Oklahoman. Everybody has value. We can't afford to give up. We ought to be about helping people reach their full potential in life. And in the end, all of us need all of us to succeed. Thank you so much for advocating on behalf of those who need a voice at the Capitol. I wish you well. I know you're going to be successful, and I am honored to join you in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. We are honored to have you with us today and just want to acknowledge your hard work and the effort that uh, Representative Speaker of the House, now always committed public servant, Chris Steele. We appreciate those comments very much and look forward to working with you. Uh, we have, Chris mentioned some legislation. We have a legislator pre-taped again, who's gonna share some thoughts with us about the work she's been doing in the area of criminal justice reform. I'm ha happy to introduce uh, Senator Joanne Dossett, Senator J.A. Dossett. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joanna Dossett. I'm the state senator from District 35 in Tulsa for having us this morning at Virtual Day of Action and for including me among your speakers. I feel most honored to be following Speaker Steele this morning during our discussion of safe communities. Today, I'd like to speak with you about two Senate bills, Senate Bill 904 and Senate Bill 902. I filed both of these bills at the beginning of the 2021 legislative session. And they both relate to Medicaid access for individuals who are justice involved. 904 focuses on the beginning or the entry point of one's involvement in our justice system. And 902 focuses on the end or the sunset of someone's involvement. But the goal of each is to ensure continuity of health care for incarcerated Oklahomans. We know that such continuity of care will help our communities stay healthier and safer over the long run. Let's talk first about Senate Bill 904. Senate Bill 904 directs the Oklahoma Health Care Authority not to terminate, but rather to suspend or press pause, if you will, on an individual's Medicaid enrollment when they become involved in the justice system, or in other words, come under the custody of Department of Corrections. The goal of this pause, rather than a, a termination of Medicaid benefits, is that when the individual leaves custody, they would be able to restart their Medicaid benefits and not experience any gaps in care. Senate Bill 902, on the other hand, directs the Oklahoma Health Care Authority to provide an application for Medicaid benefits to individuals who are soon to be released from our criminal justice system. 902 establishes a timeline. So 30 days prior to an individual leaving the custody of Department of Corrections, the healthcare authority would provide that application. After the individual completes the application, it would be evaluated. And if the individual is found to be eligible for Medicaid enrollment, they would be enrolled prior to leaving their Department of Corrections custody. I'm happy to report that both of these bills are still alive, not on the floor for the 2021 legislative session, but rather still in Health and Human Services Committee for the 2022 legislative session. I'm grateful for the extra time to dig deeper into the details of these bills and, and see how we can make them better for Oklahomans. Along the way, I've had such a good time connecting with advocacy experts, agency folks, and affected individuals to help me with the language of these bills and even to advise me on what aspects of them could be achieved in an administrative interagency fashion outside of the legislative process. I'm open to all of these ideas and more as we move forward with these bills and, and try to create something that will really help our communities stay healthier and safer. 
Thanks so much for your time. And if you ever have any questions about Senate Bills 902, 904, or other efforts to help keep our communities healthier and safer, I would love to hear from you. Thank you, OK Policy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Joanna Dawson. Thank you, Senator J.A. Dawson. She talked about the importance of uh, affected people being a participant in the process. Our next guest is an individual who works directly with those folk who are affected uh, by the criminal justice system. It's not just the people who are in the custody of the State Department of Corrections or in a county jail situation, but it's family members as well. So I'm pleased to welcome to uh, the screen uh, Donna Thompson, who is the director of the um, She'll get it. She'll get me wrong. I'll get it wrong. The prison <laughs> ministry of the Oklahoma State Baptist Convention. Baptist State. Right. Baptist, Baptist State. Convention. State. Donna's been an advocate for a long time. She's <laughs> going to share with you her thoughts as an advocate in the area of criminal justice. Thank you for being with us, Donna. Thank you. I appreciate you so much for allowing me to be a part of this actual event. Uh, I noticed that uh, Mr. Steele called you Senator Munson. I still do too, so uh, I didn't feel really bad. How are you, Senator Munson? And to the whole team, thank you so much for allowing me to participate. Um, I actually just want to share, I think everybody that has spoken prior to me has had so much great information that I've just been writing notes and writing notes, and so I will be following up on a lot of of the discussion. And that's what I want to share with the community, uh, people in the criminal justice system to uh, educate yourself on how best to help those who are incarcerated uh, as well as their family members um, during the department that are in the Department of Corrections as well as when they return home. Many people, in my opinion, have their own opinion but your opinion really doesn't matter. I say that in a loving way, if you're not registered in vote and you are eligible to do so. Because we put people in office um, in order for us to help us individually, collectively, as a community, as a state, so that our lives can be much better uh, based upon their decision. But as each one of us spoke, um, our legislators doesn't always know what we want. And so it would be really good if you could make that phone call. Uh, Representative Bell gave a list of ways to contact your legislature, which was very, very great. Uh, and I think that when you have loved ones who are incarcerated or have been incarcerated or any of the other areas that were discussed, uh, Medicaid, even mental health, uh, those things like that. I think that um, the first thing we need to do is to find out how our legislators feel about that by telling them how you feel about it and what you would like for them to do and, uh, and contact in one of those ways that Representative uh, Bell had put out there. Many people are confused about some areas. And there are a lot of town hall meetings that are going on uh, in the community. Um, virtually, you can just get on any town hall meeting there is. And due to COVID, there's been several of them. So we're still staying informed. Uh, it just depends on your method as to how to um, get this information. So I encourage everyone to uh, find out about different areas. So uh, the, the senator that talked about the Department of Corrections uh, and the Medicaid, some of you have people who will be getting out that will need this. So I encourage you to contact her uh, and let her know what you think about this, how you can help, how important it is for you. And if you, to be honest, if you don't like it, you can say that as well. But for me, your voice counts. Everybody's voice is important. Some people will sit back and won't say or do anything. And I say this in love and complain, but that's not what we need. We need you to get out, help us, help us to 
register people to vote, send out emails, send that, put post stuff on Facebook. If you're on this call right now, please just share it and put your opinions in, your thoughts about it. But like my pastor, Dr. John A. Reed Jr. said, he says it all the time. Not all of us can do everything, but we all can do something. So I encourage you to do whatever part fits you. Um, and if you're interested in helping us with the criminal justice system, uh, my number is 405-209-6750. That's 405-209-6750. We welcome people to come and help us. We need people to do all types of things. And it depends upon your your uh, schedule and how you want to do it because we need help. We need help and our communities need help. Um, and if it's just making a phone call to the legislature, sending a letter or either just providing information to the community about what's going on. We have um, um, situations coming up like with the, the school board, the chairperson for that or the president of the school board coming up and we want people to get out and register and vote. It's important as a preventive measure to put people in place that are going to help our children so that they don't have to come see me because some decisions that they made it ended up in being incarcerated. Our children are our first priority because we really, really want you to know that our children need our help with COVID. Um, that's going to be a lot of things that people will need um, to help our children to kind of get them back into place. And so we encourage you, whether it's from the juvenile to our senior citizens, uh, we encourage you to just become a part of helping us um, to do this. So I, I kind of just want to encourage everybody to play a role. That's what I'm here for. I'm advocating for people to participate as someone was speaking about numbers, we do better in numbers. So if you have anything that you would like to do, or uh, I don't know what you would like to do, um, just give me a call. Again, my number is 405-209-6750. Once the prisons open back up, um, they give us the permission to come back. Um, we do have a list of things. Not everybody wants to go to the prison and that's okay, but you can do other things to help Again, I focus so strongly on registering to vote, uh, not just registering, but voting. I, lastly, I want to just kind of say that there's a misunderstanding that you cannot register and vote with a felony conviction. That is incorrect. So let me share with you. And what I would love for you to do is to share this information with others. If you have a felony conviction, once the amount of time of the original sentence has expired, you can register and vote. So let me be clear. If you had a felony conviction and you were convicted, everything starts at conviction date. You, an example would be if you were convicted January 1st, 2000, and I'm going to pick a random number. So on January 1st, 2000, you were convicted. The judge sentenced you to seven years. That's the original sentence. Okay, so you take January 1st, 2000, you add the number of years that the judge gave you, and you get January 1st, 2007. That is the formula. You start with the date of conviction, the number of years that the judge gave you, and once you add those together, you're eligible. You're eligible. You're eligible to register and vote. And so we have so many people in our state that are not a part of that process because they don't know. Not only do we want them to register and vote, we want family members to register and vote. And with this information, um, I plan to do as much voters registration and give out information to people so that they can know that they can register and vote. Great information, Donna. Thank you so very much. My friend, Donna Thompson, who I'm going to nominate to be the Prison Ministries Director for Life. Thank you, <laughs> Donna. And the Voter Registration Queen of America. She said it, Kyle, voting matters. Your voice 
counts. And a friend said to me, too many people have been silenced. Not that they don't have a voice, they've just been silenced. So a, a voting people is a powerful people and people who speak up are also powerful. Kyle, I think we still encouraging people to put uh, their names and information in the comment section because we're going to give another gift certificate now or a gift card and we're going to do one more before it's over. So Kyle, what's your Absolutely. Think? Um, so our next winner for a $25 gift card will be um, Marianne Smith. So Marianne, be looking for one of our uh, team members to be reaching out to you. Uh, and congratulations and thank you for watching. Um, I did just see one of our mutual friends, Angela, Stephanie Coleman from down at Ardenmore commented and gave a round of applause to um, Miss Donna. So thank you for tuning in, Stephanie. Uh, it's great to see you watching live. And thank you again to all of our advocates who are joining us today live on this feed. Um, we appreciate you, and today wouldn't be successful without you. So thank you, advocates, for tuning in and joining us. And those advocates like Kyle, I know many of you are social media savvy, so share this information. Uh, this program today can be viewed post-event. So even once we sign off, you can still go to the Together Oklahoma homepages, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and pull this up along with other programs that we've done. And be informed. It could be in the middle of the night. Take your leisure, uh, drink a cup of coffee, glass of wine, uh, educate yourself about public policy. And then after all of that, if you've not signed up to participate in Together Oklahoma, sign up. We need you. As Donna said, your voice counts. So we are on, Kyle, to our last segment. Um, we have a very powerful speaker who's going to come to us pre-recorded. Uh, and this is an area that I could talk about probably in my sleep forever and a day, uh, given my engagement in healthcare reform since about 1981, when we started trying to expand Medicaid and create universal access to healthcare coverage. And I think about it, it's uh, 40 years ago. I don't know, I guess I started at about five years old or so. Uh, but in reality, of course, I was an adult 40 years ago working on Medicaid uh, expansion and we have it now. And it's so important for people to sign up. Come July 1 of this year, uh, the Medicaid program will open up to a whole lot of new people. About 200,000 new Oklahomans will be eligible for health coverage who were not eligible before. So there's no more categorical test. You no longer have to be a person under 18 or an adult with a child under 18 or somebody over 65 or somebody with a disability. All you have to do is make sure uh, that you apply and meet that income eligibility requirement, which is a bit higher. We use the number 133, 138% of poverty. Uh, somebody smarter than I can give us that number, but it's working class. Keep in mind, if you make minimum wage in Oklahoma and you're a family of one or a family of four in a minimum wage uh, household, you're below the federal poverty level. So Kyle, you know, people, so do I, yeah. hit that level and we need them to apply, right, for Medicaid. Yeah, and I know that one of our advocates who has been doing this work um, longer than I've been here with Together Oklahoma, um, he's even featured in one of the photos in our slideshow with Steve Goldman was supposed to be with us today, um, but had to step out uh, for an appointment. Um, but I do wanna say that he, he is available to answer questions around enrollment. Uh, so if you do have questions, feel free to email info at togetherok.org, and I would be happy to forward those questions on to him and get you connected uh, to Steve Goldman, who, like I said, is, has been one of our very passionate advocates that has been doing this work for a very long time alongside you, Angela. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Steve because he is uh, not only a passionate advocate, he knows a whole lot about enrolling in Medicaid. Uh, there's a, a program, a national program, the Navigator Program here in Oklahoma. It's operated through Legal Aid, where Steve works, and they'll help you navigate through the system. So there are resources that people say, it's so complicated. I don't know how to apply. I don't know what to do. Uh, there are people who stand ready to help you. And like Kyle said, you know, contact us through Together Oklahoma. Uh, we'll make sure not only that you get to the resources you need, but we'll also kind of pull you in, teach you how to be an advocate and give you many opportunities to use your voice because your voice does count. Uh, so 
Um, we, we will come back after Steve. We're going to announce another winner to the gift card, talk about the uh, meetings that we want to establish between our advocates and our legislators and some things to come. So Kyle, just start thinking about all those things you have on your list that uh, are coming up next that we want our advocates to be engaged in. Uh, stay with us. I do want to acknowledge, um, uh, Donna asked me to please acknowledge the president of the, and I'm not going to get it right, but I'm going to try it, the Oklahoma State, Oklahoma Baptist State Convention. Uh, I think that's close. Uh, Reverend Anthony Scott, I think he hails from Tulsa. Uh, and I do want to acknowledge their work because that convention has been, all those churches that make up that convention have been actively involved in meeting personal human needs of family members and others, of family members of those who are incarcerated and people who are incarcerated themselves. So our next speaker to talk about health care and the importance of our engagement in the Medicaid program and some of the issues we're facing. I talked about the expansion, but we got to do it right. We must do it correctly. And I'm, I'm very pleased to introduce a healthcare care professional who also is a um, the president, let me give Steve his props. Uh, he is the Oklahoma Academy of Family Physicians Legislative Chair, uh, Legislative Committee Co-Chair, and he also is the board chair for the Oklahoma Alliance of Healthy Families, showing you that physicians can be advocates too. If physicians can take time and be really good advocates for people, certainly we can. So I am very pleased to introduce next uh, for a recorded message, our friend, Dr. Steve Crawford. Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Crawford. I'm uh, chair of the Oklahoma Alliance for Healthy Families, and I'm also co-chair of the Oklahoma Academy of Family Physicians Legislative Committee. And I want to talk today about the importance of health care access for everyone. I believe that there are three principal reasons that everyone needs to have access to quality health care. The first issue I believe has to do with that it's a human right. Um, we don't allow people to sit on the side of the road with broken bones and heal on their own. We believe it's a human right to be able to go get health care. But more importantly, we need to try to prevent uh, accidents or health issues from occurring. So we need to intervene early and to be able to do that, we have to give people access to the preventive care, early onset or early access to care when they are, uh, when diseases and conditions are preventable, whether it be things like diabetes, obesity, hypertension, stroke, but also many of the things that children are exposed to, particularly uh, vaccine preventable diseases that give us a fighting chance to make a difference in our lives. I also wanna speak on the issue of economics. I think it's critical that we as a state and a nation have health, a healthy citizenry. If we don't, if our citizens aren't healthy, we won't have a healthy economy. We won't attract business. We won't be able to withstand the challenges that many of the countries that we compete against who do have robust healthcare systems can, uh, defend themselves and prevent diseases from ravaging their communities. And so I also think it's a national security issue that all peoples that we have within our borders are protected by access to health care and preventable and treatable diseases. Uh, the, the last thing that I think is important is, is that it helps prevent diseases from affecting others. As we've seen during the pandemic, when somebody gets infected, it can affect other people because there's a period of time when people become infected that they are contagious, but not symptomatic yet. The asymptomatic carrier as it's called. And if we don't give those people access to getting testing and such, we then create diseases that occur to other people that may have access to health care, and it impacts them and costs them illness and um, 
uh, challenges to deal with. So we need to be able to provide access to healthcare to all individuals that are within our uh, purview, as it were. And if we're talking about Oklahoma, we need to get everyone covered in Oklahoma and take care of those people that were within our borders. But I believe it's true that we need to be doing it for our nation and actually for our world. Uh, there's obviously the debate on who should get the vaccine and we should start with those that are at highest risk and those that are exposed because they're providing care to those individuals. But I believe we need to be advocating for a worldwide program to provide access to vaccines to prevent this pandemic from spreading not only to them, but also back to us. Because if we don't do that, we will have, unfortunately, the development of what we've seen occurring is the more contagious variants of this COVID virus that can um, overpower or bypass the, the vaccine that's currently occurring. So again, the three things that I think are important is, is the that it's a human right that, that everyone have access to quality health care. The second issue is, is the economic and uh, security, national security issue that I think are critical that we need to have a robust and healthy population to be as strong a nation as we can. And the, and the, third, the third issue is, is that it helps prevent the spread of disease and, and contagion as it were to, to many others that could be affected by uh, illness. And so we need to protect ourselves by protecting others and providing them healthcare access to. Coverage is currently provided through a variety of means, one of which is Medicaid um, that we've had in our state for many years. One of our former uh, legislators back in the 60s was one of the strong advocates for doing a Medicaid program or a Medicaid light program um, for our state and for the entire nation. And, and um, a recent legislator was very supportive of moving us to a more managed care type of Medicaid program in the, in the early 90s, which we did. And we experimented with a managed care type program. But unfortunately, that program did not work well and our Medicaid agency trans, transitioned to a more robust single payer type of program that we believe as practitioners within our state went, has worked very well and very effectively and very economically. Obviously, there are some challenges that they can probably address a little bit better but I believe across the nation, our Medicaid agency is looked at as a beacon of excellence in how to do manage Medicaid in our state. And notice I'm saying manage Medicaid because our agency does manage Medicaid throughout the state using a primary care um, patient-centered medical home. What we're looking to transfer to is a commercially managed Medicaid program with four different providers. And some say, well, that will provide competition. I believe that it could provide some competition and they'll, they'll work at trying to attract patients to their plan or this plan. The problem with that is, is that it increases the hassle factor for patients and it increases the hassle factor for providers. It also increases the costs of care uh, substantially by twice or three times the cost that we're already expending. You have to expend some money in administering the program, but we're currently at an exceedingly low rate of four to five percent per year of the amount of money that are expended to manage this group of patients. If we go to a commercially managed care, these companies rightfully will have to make some money to be able to take the risk to do this, but they need to make anywhere between twice to three times the amount of administrative costs to make it worthwhile for them to compete in this type of market. And I don't believe as a clinician, nor do I believe as a provider or a 
um, person that's been involved in um, Medicaid and an advocate for the patient center medical home, that this is a appropriate or valid way to manage our Medicaid system in our state. And thank you, Dr. Crawford, for sharing with us. Um, well, this has been a wonderful day, packed full of information, and we're getting towards the end. We will be running a few minutes over, so I ask for a little grace from our advocates tuning in and watching us. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I'm extremely excited for our next uh, speaker um, because Representative Pay has been a wonderful um, a legislator for our advocates to work with and, and work around. Um, he has served on many of our panels down in his district, uh, talking about information that we've talked about today, uh, specifically the earned income tax credit refundability, um, and has just been a wonderful person to work with. And not only have we had a lot of opportunity to work with him through Together Oklahoma, um, way back before Representative Pay was a legislator, he was one of our Summer Policy Institute uh, students who joined us over the summer to learn all about policy in the state of Oklahoma, how it works, all the information, and really getting into the weeds of policy work. Um, and it's one of my favorite programs that OK Policy puts on. Um, and we are excited and hopeful that we'll be able to have that this summer with students. Um, but Representative Pay just wants to share a little bit about that experience. Um, so up next, we have Representative Pay. Hello, this is Representative Daniel Pay. I represent House District 62, which covers West and South Lawton. I am now in my second term as a state legislator, uh, currently serving as the youngest at the age of 25. I was born and raised in Lawton and graduated from the University of Oklahoma in 2017. Uh, right now, we're in the midst of a busy deadline week, so I apologize for not joining live, uh, but I do want to thank all of you uh, for tuning in and for taking some time out of the day uh, to be a part of this program. It's vitally important that we engage ourselves when it comes to local and state matters. Um, those issues directly impact our, uh, our lives. And so if there's anything I can do uh, to help you personally in terms of being more civically engaged, uh, please call, email, text me. Uh, i be more than happy to help. Um, other than that, uh, thanks again for watching and have a good day. All right, thank you, Representative Pei. Uh, Kyle, it's exciting to know that both Summer Policy Institute, Together Oklahoma chapters are just ways that people can move from you know, being a great advocate in their communities to being a great advocate in the state legislature. So we're going to encourage folk again, togetheroklahoma.org, sign up for our, our activities to be a part of our chapter, to go to okpolicy.org, look at our positions on papers. We do great research, great factual information. I just want to say thank you, Kyle. You've been a great co-host with me. I want to say thanks to Dr. Crawford again for that passionate, from a provider perspective for, I know, a whole lot of decades, uh, talking about the importance of Medicaid expansion, to Donna Thompson, uh, Chris Spe Steele, Speaker Spe Steele, excuse me, uh, to Paul, who still had some technical difficulties, couldn't get in. He's got a lot of stuff written people can read. Uh, and to Bailey. Bailey was one of us, and she moved on to, I don't want to say bigger and better things because we're good right here, but she's moved on to some pretty hefty duty lifts around the country. So we're so pleased that she could join us again today into Representative Bale, who came live even during a busy time at the session to be with us. I just want to say thank you to them all. And of course, to uh, Representative Virgin, and we could never get that video to work right. We're going to get it and post it so people can hear her greetings. And to Senator Floyd, who were with us. Uh, to Steve, who had some complications. I know he had a, an appointment, so his time was crazy. Thanks for saying yes to be with us today. I hope I didn't miss anything. We're going to uh, tell everybody, those of you, let me just say this finally, who signed up for legislative visits this afternoon. 
You should have gotten a Google Meet notice from us, sign in. Uh, there have been some juggling in schedules and there may still be some juggling of legislative schedules because this is session. Uh, we're going to plan more of those kinds of meetings, right, Kyle? We're going to do a lot of those things. Absolutely. And if folks didn't get signed up today, I would strongly encourage you uh, just like Representative Bell, I encouraged you to as well, to reach out directly to your legislator's office today um, and speak about the things that you we, we talked about today, the things that you're learning about. Um, and you can go to okpolicy.org under the resource site to find the Find My Legislator tool um, to help you identify who your legislator is. And it also gives you their contact information so you can call their office, speak with their LA, leave them a voicemail, shoot them a quick email, follow up with them, stay in contact with your legislator and help to influence and craft the policy that affects your daily life, which is what we do at Together Oklahoma as advocates is work on helping to craft and, and tailor some of that policy that affects us every day and share our experiences and our stories with our legislators and get connected. And you said it, let's all get connected. Guys, thank you for being with us today. To all of our guests, thank you for participating. To all of you who viewed this show now and in the future, thank you for watching. And we hope that you will join us truly to make Oklahoma a better place to live. Kyle, thank you. I love you so. Thank you. And you said it. Let's get connected. And Everybody thank you. have a great day. Anything else, Kyle? No, thank you so much, Angela, for all the work too behind the scenes building up to this and, and for being so graceful today and hosting with me. Uh, you're great. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon.